friends, freaks, friends I have not met yet. Hello, everyone. So, I come to you today unapologetically as an artist. An artist who began miserably with horrible, horrible things that most people would think, oh, I never want actual people to read this. This was just so I could become a true artist. But I don't think that's true. I am not going to apologize for the quality of the first piece that I'm going to read for you because I wrote it when I was eight years old for school. <laughs> Today I'm bringing you a before and an after picture. I'm gonna read you before I became a true artist, when I first started. And then I'm gonna read you something that I wrote just earlier this year. This is called Smokey, I love you. It's even on paper, like when I was in eighth grade and people still wrote on paper. <laughs> it's something that you smoke. <laughs> it really is. Look at that. This is the future. <laughs> See, I've had eight. Remember, eight years old. Um, there's even some notes on here, but I'm not going to correct what was corrected. I'm just going to read it to you the way I wrote it when I was eight years old. Smokey, I love you. I remember the time that every pet owner dreads, the day their pet dies. Smokey was a very good cat. He was more tolerable than most cats. He had the loudest purr in the neighborhood, and he loved the outdoors. We got him when I was about seven years old, and he was a kitten. We had him for about eight years, and he was about the best pet you could ask for. Sure, we didn't play fetch or go on walks or play at all, but he did sit in your lap and listen to your problems. You could tell him anything. Private things that you can't tell your friends or personal things that you can't tell anyone. He had a funny habit that he did when he sat in your lap. He'd stick his claws in your leg when he was happy. If he didn't, then he'd get up soon and go off somewhere else. You always had to pet him when he was around you. And if you annoyed him, he'd tell you by hissing, and you really hit a nerve, then he'd scratch you. That wouldn't happen often. We learned fast. <laughs> One day, as I was talking to my mom, she brought up Smokey. I am worried about Smokey, she said. I gave a light laugh. What is there to worry about? This is Smokey we're talking about, I replied carelessly. With a worried expression, she lamented, but he's been gone for three days. He usually comes back by now. I even put some tuna out, and only the ants found it. Calm down, Mom. If Smokey didn't know how to take care of himself, then he would have left us long ago. You are right, Sarah. I should stop worrying. I'm sure he will turn up soon. I left the kitchen, pondering my mom's words. It was true. Smokey had been missing for three days. But he'd been gone that long before. I really shouldn't worry. But deep down inside, I worried a lot. Later that night, I was watching TV, and Amy came in, running to the bathroom, getting up. I asked my sister, what is going on? Grabbing a towel, Amy replied, Smokey turned up and he's in bad shape. We are taking him to the vet right now, so if you want to come, then let's go. We won't wait. As she left the house, I grabbed some shoes and hurried after her. In the car, I got a good look at Smokey. Immediately, I wished I hadn't. His left eye was swollen and he couldn't open his jaw. He meowed a lot, but it came out muffled and thick. His coat was matted and clotted with mud. He smelled really bad. All during that awful car ride, Amy kept petting Smokey, telling him it would be okay, that he would get better. I tuned out her words. I just couldn't hear them. When we got to the vet, we were given a room to wait in almost immediately. And when the vet came in to take Smokey to be examined after only a few minutes. About 10 minutes later, the vet came back and explained the damage to our cat. I will never forget her words. He is in pretty bad shape, his eyes swollen beyond repair. If we did surgery, we'd have to remove it. His jaw is broken in the middle, and we think also on the right side. That was why he couldn't open it. The middle break is easy to mend, but the side is more tricky. And one thing is for sure, if he recovers, he will never be the same. The words hit me like a blow to the heart. My cat was going to die. There were too many ifs in that to suit me. I felt numb all over. I dimly became aware that I was crying. The vet left again to give the news time to sink in. Amy also left. She said she just couldn't take it anymore. When the vet came back, she told us the best thing for him would be to put him to sleep. 
If they did the surgery, then he would be in for a lot of pain. And on the road to recovery, there was no guarantee he would recover. At this, I turned and sobbed on my mom's shoulder. The vet had brought some information on cremation and burial services for us to look at. My mom took the cremation packets and told the vet that they would call her in the morning and inform her of the decision. When we got home, I ran to my room and cried myself to sleep. I couldn't believe that my best friend was gone. I wanted to know why he was taken from us, so I set out to ask everyone in the family. I didn't know I was making them feel worse. The next afternoon, my mom told me that they cremated Smokey and spread his ashes on the grounds of the School of Ageless Wisdom. I went to my room and cried some more. That night, I had a dream. My parents came to wake me up. They told me they had a surprise. Half-heartedly, I followed them. When they opened the door, I heard laughter. Instantly, a wave of anger swept over me. Smokey just died. Why are they laughing at a time like this? I stormed into the living room and found the source of the laughter. There was a kitten in the living room, and everyone was playing with it. It saw me and walked over and rubbed its side against my leg. As I looked up at my parents' unconditional love for the wonderful thing beside me already flowing through me, I awoke. The warm, happy feeling inside me swiftly faded to sadness. At that moment, though, I realized Smokey had a purpose in being our pet. He taught me to love nature and all its wonderful creations. Nature is the mother of all things, and we should fight to protect it. I now understand why Smokey was taken from us in this way. It was to teach me that I needed to protect Mother Nature, and she will protect me. There's one last thing I would like to tell Smokey. Smokey, I love you. Now we move on to the past where we have technology. It does, right? It's all thick and clunky and stuff. Barely fits in my hand. So, <laughs> well, I hope that bit's not clunky. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway. I'm going to read an excerpt from a novel that I wrote for National Novel Writing Month last year um, that I still haven't finished, but I finished this excerpt. Yay! <laughs> so this is my after picture, because um, of course I can't take something I've written in 20 years and read that to you, otherwise I would. Um, I titled the excerpt, The Severed. The Severed had always been an unspoken horror discussed in whispers, cast as victims or villains in campfire stories. No one ever took it for granted, and among the packs, for certain, it was tantamount to a death sentence. He didn't know how other cultures handled it, but he knew what happened when he suffered among the packs. He'd seen it once, while they were visiting another pack. Brandon had been young then, but old enough to remember and put the pieces together. He'd been playing with several other boys his age, throwing a ball around and chasing each other without any need for rules or structure. A hush had fallen over the whole pack before any of the kids knew what was happening. The laughter died. The pup stuck their tail was between their legs and hid behind their boys. A woman came staggering to their line of sight around a building on the other side of town. She wasn't hurt, but her face and her arms were covered in scratches, as if she walked blindly through the forest and let all the sharp branches scrape over her skin. The look on her face drew all the boys into a knot together, the pups behind them, staring wide-eyed at her. Brandon didn't know her, but a few of the boys in the pack whispered the same name, so he knew she had been one of theirs. No longer. A loose ring of men formed around her as she staggered to a halt, her hand, their hands spread and open, talking soothingly to her. She didn't seem to be paying attention. He wasn't sure she'd even noticed them at all. That face, those eyes, held absolutely nothing. Not even pain or fear, which he thought he would feel if he ever lost his pup, Zian. Just nothing. When one of the men approached and let her off by the arm, she didn't protest. She seemed beyond even noticing. The other men watched them leave for a moment, then dispersed. The boys around Brandon left, running off home to be with their parents. Brandon sat down right where he was. Zian crawled into his lap. He put his arms firmly around the pup and held him close, staring at the last place he'd seen that woman. The last place he knew anyone in the pack, except that one man, would ever see her again. He didn't need to be told what happened to her after that. He knew. 
He just didn't want to. When his father found him a little later, he sat down next to his son and put an arm around the pair of them. Felix curled around on the other side, resting his head on Brandon's feet. Even though he knew, Brandon still questioned his father, pushing for some other explanation. But Kenneth did not pull any punches. He explained. In simple terms, a child couldn't understand, but it was still the truth about why she had been alone and why she shouldn't be left that way. No one would leave her to that pain, Kenneth had said. Forcing her to keep living would be mean. For her sake, we helped her so she wouldn't hurt anymore. In the only way that really matters, she was already dead. And after you die, you can't keep living. Brandon cuddled close to his father, squeezing his eyes shut. If I lost Zian, would you help me, Daddy? Kenneth's arm tightened around him and Felix whined. Of course I would. I love you. I wouldn't let you stay in pain. 